Yes, check, check, check. Does this work? Mike? All right. So, I think it's, it's showtime for us. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining me today. This is the last thing between the event and the funner part. But I think that there's a few things that we can, we can discuss. I hope that you get something to take home from my presentation, and that at least you make other mistakes, but not the same ones that I've made already. So, building a world-class marketing ops team through value, focus, and diversity is gonna be the topic of the talk today. This is specific to marketing ops, but you could also abstract it and apply to any other team. My experience, though, is in building marketing operations teams. A tiny bit about who's this person on the stage. My name is Jaime. I work at Ivan, which is an open source managed software service provider. And uh, I have a bit of an unconventional background for working in MarTech. I studied energy technology, nuclear engineering. Uh, however, it translates surprisingly well to marketing technology. And I've tried to stay on top of the, or stay sharp, hence like me continuing studying uh, machine learning, things like that. And I'm very honored to be a sales for marketing champion and share that kind of class with some of the people around here and to continue developing the sales for marketing ecosystem. And yes, if you want to see me happy, give me a rugby ball, give me a musical instrument, any. Um, so I even, the company I work for, as I said, managed software. Um, we take all these high powered, difficult to use open source tools like Apache Kafka, MySQL, Postgres, uh, Grafana, and we made them easy to use, commoditized um, for developers and DevOps people or even technical decision makers. Instead of dealing with the hassle of managing this on your own, we can manage it for you, make sure it stays up, it's upgraded, it's patched, it's not vulnerable, and you can use it in any cloud. So if you're building any application or any use case that requires, for example, an open search or like a product recommendation engine, which runs very nicely in, in Apache Kafka, this can be useful. But what are we gonna discuss today? I'm going to boil down the talk to three things. First one is purpose and how to instill purpose in your team. Second one is, okay, now that we know what are we here to do, who do we want to do it with? And my stance on that is that diversity is a very significant competitive advantage. And the last part of the talk is going to be about productization and taking what used to be like an individual work of art turning into a production um, process of marketing operations. So first, values and vision. And I wrote here a note for me when I, when I first made the slides, like more than a pretty slide, which is exactly what it needs to be. If your values are just a slide that you made once and you never looked at again, it's as good or worse as not having any. I, I did a poll through the event app before the talk about does your team have clearly defined values? And it was interesting to see that it was more or less kind of split 50-50. Some people were very sure that their team had values and what those were, and the other half of the audience didn't. Um, if you don't, when you go back to your teams, start thinking about that. Put something in the calendar so that you together with your team think about those values and define those. Um, and if there's one hill I will die on, it's this. For me and for my people and my team, I always tell them that you first take care of yourself, make sure that you're healthy, you're psychologically and physically healthy. If that requires them off, you take them off. Then you take care of your loved ones, your family, your pet, whatever that is. Only when these two are in place, I can expect you to take care of work. So I will repeat these ad nauseum. Um, I, I make sure that everybody in my team feels not guilty about taking time off, and I will be an example of that. If one day I'm feeling exceptionally lousy because I'm very overburdened and stressed, I will tell my team, I'm taking a day off today, when you feel like this, this is the right thing to do. Please do it as well. You will never face any negative consequences for it. So now that I have not died on that hill, um, what makes a team effective? And this is a, a research that, uh, or a study that, that Google did a few years ago about what makes a team effective uh, for them at Google. And the number one factor was psychological safety, that people feel safe to take risks and to be vulnerable with each other and to feel taken care of by the team. That's why, for me, it's extremely important that people 
can take time off for themselves or for the loved ones before I can expect them to be dependable, to have structure, to find meaning and to deliver impact. So first and foremost, psychological safety. If we miss that, the rest don't really matter. But let's assume that we have it, that we have a team that feels psychologically safe, that can be questioned, can question your leadership. How do we find this meaning and impact? For us, it came down to asking, okay, who are we as a team? And what are we here to do? What is actually important to us? When we ponder a new addition to the team, what do we want that person to bring to us? Um, and it's something that can be done in a one-day workshop. There are many exercises. You can have an external facilitator for that. Um, but there's also excellent guides on, on the internet about how to boil down the whole thing to a few, a few values, three, four, five. And for us, when we went and answered these questions over and over and over and over over a whole day, we came down with this, that the bedrock of all of it for us is trust, that we can trust each other and, and feel trusted by our management, by our team members. Um, and we do things together. People in my team skew a certain way in which they prefer to do things together rather than do them alone or not do them at all. So togetherness is a significant driver for us and people naturally gravitate towards working with others. It's a bit more difficult in a remote team, but it's still very doable if you, if you put emphasis on it. And then, yes, we trust each other, we do things together, but we want bright people, audacious people. And these are things that we specifically hire for when we publish uh, an open position or when we interview. Uh, the interview guys in my team and the people who are conducting interviews will try to gauge, like, how oh, audacious is this person? If I give them a loosely defined problem, will they find a solution? Will they kind of blaze a path and, and show me that this was doable? So now that we know that we need to be trustworthy, we want to do things together, and we want bright and audacious people, and we know exactly who we are, where are we going, when everything else fails, these are the four things that are important about us, and I'm willing to compromise on anything else except these four things. Right, so now we have psychological safety, purpose, some sort of an identity. What do we do with it? Well, this is what, um, we decided that we wanted to do with it and keeps being um, a driving force in, in, kind of in our processes. I manage two teams currently, a marketing content team, which does what it says on the label, they produce copy, graphics, video, and a marketing operations proper team, which does web analytics, marketing technology, etc. And these people who share the same values they, however, see themselves a little bit differently. Like my content team, what they want to do, and they, they want to dedicate effort to shine light on the true value of our company, our product. However, the marketing operations people, they see things a little bit differently. What they want to do is, going back to this slide, brightness and audacity. They want to create bright solutions and do it together. Even though they are pretty similar people, they want to work differently and they're empowered to do so. And as a result, we get kind of different, different results, different problems as well. But now we know who they are, what do they want to do, and how they're going to do it. And now this moves us into, into diversity. So we saw first how a bunch of relatively different people come together and boil down what unites them, it, which is extremely important. But as much unity there is diversity, and these are a very different group of people to begin with. So even though we share a core, the extra flavor, the extra power that each person brings in is very important for us and we cherish and embrace that. And again, specifically look for it. So there's plenty of literature on diversity and it's something that kind of one can do more explicitly or less explicitly, but there's no arguing with the fact that diverse teams focus more on facts that these kind of teams also process these facts more carefully, and there's very good research on this, for example, in juries. Um, and that diverse teams are straight out more innovative. When we group think with people who look like us, walk like us, talk like us, study the same thing, we lose quite a bit of edge in innovativeness. So if I'm trying to be audacious and bright, being homogeneous is really not a good thing. 
I encourage everybody to have a look at that. That article is very good. It explains like why diversity is important in a few paragraphs. Um, and how does this kind of transform to or turn into marketing operations excellence? If I want to have a team that is the very best in B2B marketing operations, um, we use this email, which is it's like, like a climbing wall. Any climbers here? No, no climbers. Okay. Go and try it at some point if you, if you feel like it. If you're not afraid of heights, it's a fantastic sport. Um, but you can just picture yourself like if you were in front of a climbing wall and you know you have to get all the way up there to the top, to the top of marketing operations excellence. There are three things you need to do. The first one is the first or the next three, four graphs for my feet and for my hands. So how do I implement in incremental progress with the tools I have today, with the things that I can see and I can easily grab. And that is execution for us or implementation. Uh, bread and butter. If everything else fails, this is what keeps us alive. However, that is just, just keeps me more or less static. I need to look even further up and for that I need development. I need people who apart from just implementing what I have can dream up. What should we have? How am I gonna get over the next ridge? What should I know when I'm there? And that means having, yes, a development team. People who build tools, build processes, and keep us going up. The last part, if I don't know how far up the wall I am, I will never get to the top. So I also want measurability. I want a set of people whose emphasis is only in measuring how are our tools and process working, and who can tell us what do I need to tinker with if I want to get to the top, and who can tell me also when I'm at the top? So maximum bank for a bank, continuous progress. And that is measurability analytics. You can probably imagine that these three departments house very different people with very different skill sets. That's why we put also emphasis in diversity. We see that people who are good at this are not necessarily good at this and get very bored if they do this. So figuring this out before we start building a team helped us hire a set of professionals who are good and can add value to each of the three boxes. There is something that Carlos from nowadays Learning Experience Alliance says that, that you should Tetris your marketing operations team. You've probably heard the term T-shaped profiles. People who have comp deep competence in one area but can still hold their weight at basically anything else. If we go back here, I'll have people who are very, very good at measurability, can hands-on implement things in part of, or can run a report in Salesforce. I'll have web developers who still um, know how to build an email with dynamic content in part of. A certain level of com basic competence in all three pillars is very important to us, but also deep competence in their own area. Again. Diversity, I don't want 20 pieces like this. I will never finish my Tetris level. I want one of each or some, some sort of assortment of these with which I can build success. And how does this look like? Well, if you, if you draw a competence map of your team, these are, for example, competences that are important for us, in general, for marketing operations, um, some sort of creative side, MarTech, uh, user experience design and analytics, um, and this is like a pretty stock graphic, but it actually looks pretty close to reality. If I look at my MarTech team, and sorry for the small font, like these are different individuals and their strengths and development areas. So think about it. If I now need to hire people to this team, what kind of person will I hire? Well, I clearly need to cover a bit of this and a bit of this so I know what to look for in a job ad. I don't want more people who are extremely good at this because they will not add anything new to the team. Just a simple graphical representation of it will already help you um, not skew always the same way and not transfer your own biases into your team. Let's see. One additional note, something that we have seen time and again and again that is a very good predictor of success at our teams is numeracy. People who don't necessarily need to have a, a PhD in math, nothing like the sort, but who are comfortable around numbers, who are comfortable around code. 
um, all of us, I think, in the house today are in that camp. But it's not necessarily what a business school or university teaches. So it's very difficult to instill numeracy in a person after they have completed their studies. And I would love to work with all of you, with the whole Salesforce community, to bring this to education earlier. So that when people study, they are comfortable with code, even if they don't make it themselves. They're comfortable with numbers. They can make um, rational decisions based on data. And the last part of what we will discuss today is productization. Um, how much value do you think this person adds to the process? Absolutely zero. Um, this is something that doesn't need to be done by a human, can be done by a machine. Do not put a human to do a machine's job. And that's something that we see very, very, very often in the Salesforce ecosystem. How many times have you imported, exported CSVs, cleaned them by hand, audited your rules? It's just that you're doing this. So if you need to do it more than once, probably we should have built some sort of prioritization for that. Um, does any of this ring a bell to you? For those of you who work in consultancy, probably very much. Um, client side, at least I say definitely, they do ring a bell. And the last one is something that has a very strong impact on people's well-being. Um, you're doing a ton of non-productive work because you're doing this. How do we fix this? Well, going from this side to this side. Not everything we do in Salesforce or in marketing operations needs to be its own work of art that you carve from beginning to the very end. Most things can be done with a mold and you productize them and they take less time, they're repeatable, you increase quality. Um, and it allows you to actually use human brain power to do things that only human can, humans can do, such as conduct retros, document things, um, design a process and especially minimize cognitive load in things that don't require cognitive load. Some of the outcome, what I see um, from, let's say a year and a half ago and my previous company as well, uh, if this is the standard, by productizing and building solid processes, you will at least double the output, free up enough time for people to do learning and development and cut at least by half burnout risk. When you look at this from the cognitive load point of view, uh, there are three types of it. I'm not going to go super deep in each of this, but this is something that doesn't add any productivity or any satisfaction to humans. This is what we kind of have to reduce. So that then again, humans can spend more time on the complexity of the task itself and on connecting these two things they've done before or they will do later in life. You don't need experience cognitive load for anything productive. So the fewer brain minutes that a person has to devote to how do I do this, the more brain minutes they can devote to these two. Um, some ideas, how can you make this happen? How does it uh, look like when you've done it? Probably you've done many of these things that you product as requests. All your requests have like a standard set of deliverables. They have an SLA. Um, they are templatized and for example, for us, um, when I start to make the presentation, if I wanted something like this, the only way my team will take in and help a salesperson who will have a presentation or me is by filling in a very standard form that already takes care of um, who's the target audience, what is it needed, when is it needed, and immediately creates a template that says like, it will be assigned to this person, the first job is due by this date, then it will be reviewed by this person. All of this is automated. I don't need anybody to think what are the steps, nor to forget or remember whether they did this or this. Again, if you need to do it more than once, probably you should automate it. And this is a very good example of automating this part. When you abstract it one level up, it allows you to do things like this, to have a very good pulse on what's the workload of your team, to whom should I assign things, who can actually help me when I need them. If the due date of my task is here, 
I'm probably going to assign it to Jade or Bree or maybe Mark, but not to Auri and not to Lily. And if you are trying to prevent, for example, burnout or excessive workload, you can immediately, without doing anything special, have an idea of who is at an increased risk of burnout. And very quickly, I said, like, if you've done it more than once, you should automate it. Well, when you've done it 176 times, you should definitely automate it. So if we hadn't done this, I would have had a lot less production, a lot more experience going to workload, and a much higher risk of people burning out or disengaging with their job and not focusing on the values. So to finish it up, the three things I hope you take home from today. First, think about the core of what you do and care for it. In the end, when things are ugly, this is what keeps you like upright, your values. Um, climb up the wall and have diverse climbers if you actually want to get to the top. It's not a relay race. You don't need four times the fastest runner. You need people who do things in different ways. And the more you productize and you build process, the less extraneous cognitive load you'll have. Automate to win. Don't ask humans to do a machine job. Thank you very much. I think that's the end of our talk. I'll be very happy to take questions. Yes? Very good question. Um, when, when hiring, the first screening is company values. So normally, when we hire people, we know they already kind of meet or align partially with those. So ours are somehow a subset of company values, just transparency, openness, developers first, and kind of people for profit. So they align pretty well. Yes. Compromising on values, definitely a mistake that I've made. Thinking that somebody who really does not embody those values can be a good worker. So for example, in, uh, interviewing a candidate who looks like an absolute superstar, top performer, but who doesn't give a damn about the trust and who's gonna run on their own. Superstars don't necessarily work well in a team if kind of you're trying to do marketing operations. So my advice on that is do not compromise on the values regardless of how super good the person looks. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to share that. It's fantastic for workload management and for people to kind of have perspective of what their, like how overloaded their colleagues might be. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it happens, it happens. Um, not everything that is called an emergency is an emergency. That's the first one. But if you have built this kind of process with SLAs and so, you actually have the wiggle room to cater to these emergencies. Um, you see that there's always somebody who doesn't have like a full workload. So we have built it with the capacity to be able to respond basically overnight to anything, like a funding announcement. We just closed our Series D. That requires that three people from my team disappear. Don't tell anybody about this for a week and work just on it. If we didn't have this and they were fully loaded, we couldn't cater to it. Yes, Lucy? Yeah. 
after values. Um, I would go with the vision, like what, what is your team here to do? Do you want to be the best in your area? Do you want to be the fastest closing, um, the most technologically advanced? Um, that would be probably my next step. Any further questions? Thank you very, very much for spending the last 25 minutes with me. Appreciate it.